Hey. Okay, that's good. Yeah. It's a good intro. Yeah, that thing you do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're a regular guy, Guy Patterson. I gotcha. <laughs> Show button lift. Okay. Okay. It's great. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think we got it. That's good. That's everybody knows what you're doing now. Okay. You're good on the drums. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I... <laughs> okay. Listen, I, I got to get up early for work. So we got to get recording this like now so we can Johnny, <clears throat> Johnny probably can't. Can you hear? Can you hear me over the? He can't hear me over the drum. John, Johnny, that's good, man. I think we're, I think we're good. I don't think this is gonna play the whole thing. It's gonna play the whole song. This, this is great. Hmm. All right. Are you, are you there? to Nostalgia Cast. I'm Johnny Craddock. And I'm Darren Lundberg. And today's episode, we are going to be discussing That Thing You Do, a 1996 film directed by Tom Hanks and starring Tom Everett Scott, Liv Tyler, Jonathan Sheck, and Steve Zahn. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's others, but I don't need to mention we'll, all of them right now. We'll chat about them. Uh, sure. Um, but before we do uh, That Thing You Do, Darren, let's do a quick recap of our last episode, which we had a guest. And what was her name again? I forget. I'm sorry. Lindsay Washburn. The great Lindsay, Lindsay Washburn. Right, Lindsay. Yep. <laughs> She's the VHS girl. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Our horror and, movie maven. Right. Right. And we chatted about From Dust Till Dawn. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that one? Well, I think uh, Lindsay obviously liked, liked the movie a lot. I think she was more than you or I, I think she liked the movie from start to, to finish, even though it was felt like two separate uh, movies. But we need that perspective. We need to hear why that works. And we had a good conversation about horror. And it's not just a horror movie tied to a specific genre. It's like, what interests us is a good movie with good quality storytelling, regardless of whatever genre it is. And that's when the best horror movies are able to reach us. And I think um, from Dust Till Dawn, where I came down is, it, again, very two distinct movies. The first half is a very Quentin Tino West movie. It's a hostage situation. It's very tense. Uh, the George Clooney, Quentin Tarantino uh, chemistry going on. You got them kidnapping Harvey Keitel, Juliette Lewis. And so there's that whole thing. But then it becomes a full on, without even any hesitation, becomes a full on vampire movie. And that's where I think a lot of people push back my pushback was it's two distinct tones that's the only problem i don't i don't have a problem with them mixing genres mm -hmm. like the grindhouse movie but the tone took a little bit to kind of get into that group how did you fall on from dust till dawn well i made it clear that i really enjoy the first half of this movie i mean i can watch that first half and not get tired of it um and i have i've watched just that part and then shut it off i i get really really i'm just bored and I just don't understand the point of the whole vampire stuff. So it just, it just is lost on me. So I have a really hard time trying to even sit through it. Yeah. And so the first half, yes, 100% I'm on board. Second half, I just could care less. Right. And I guess there could be a point, Argy. It's like, like we talked about, it's a grindhouse. It's like a movie festival in a single movie. More than, not as well-structured or, or crazily structured as like Kill Bill, where it has like an anime or a revenge movie and, you know, all this stuff that's kind of tied in together. And it kind of becomes like an amalgam of all these genres that, uh, you know, 
we loved as kids or, or movie going adults that kind of thing i just think that the movie it's two separate things i can enjoy both halves it's just the hard part is kind of getting and kind of jibing and with that middle part to to, to kind of see into the next one but again very good memories of from dust Dawn. we had a great conversation with Lindsay. I, I hope to get her back on pretty soon i love having these conversations with like-minded people who can just talk and are experts in what they're talking about and can just yeah give us so much insight into how they look at these genres and Lindsay is one of the greats and so i'm looking forward to chatting with her again okay sounds good so let's get into that thing you do but before we do let's watch the trailer okay we bow in unison and we're off the stage before the applause dies out right you have your pick right here all right keep these with you put them on put them on put them on there you go you guys look great in red have i told you that yet let's give a big welcome to the latest addition to the Playtower galaxy go, go, of the go, stars go, 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 go. doing that thing they do Okay, that thing you do. Tom Hanks's directorial debut, um, 1996, starring Tom Everett Scott, Liv Tyler, Steve Zahn, Jonathan Sheck. 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 Yep. Sheck for some reason. <laughs> that's, that's how it's spelled. Yeah. Who else is in there? Some uh, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is in there as well. Charlize Theron for the Charlize one of the first Theron, roles. Right. Holy cow! Yeah. Is in there. Or <laughs> right. Um, no, this movie, I chose this movie, obviously, uh, because I grew up playing the drums. And Really? Very <laughs> movies out there with drummers as the protagonist. I mean, there's still just a few that I can think of. Um, there's Whiplash that came out recently. Uh, and then there's Drumline. Um, the Rocker, which is one of my favorites with Randy Wilson. I think he's, you know, hilarious in that role. Yeah. Um, I never get tired of watching that movie. Um, what else? Uh, like I the, said, sound there's, of, there's, the Sound of Metal just barely came metal, out. That, that new one on Netflix, right? Yeah. I uh, haven't seen it yet. There's a Fred Armesian comedy, you know, thing where he plays drums in different styles. And there's a comedy stand-up thing, which, you know, I saw it. Wasn't the greatest thing in the world, but it was kind of fun. And then also, I think I recently saw... Uh, Count Me In, another documentary on Netflix that was kind of like, you know, diving into what it's like to be a, a hired hand as a drummer in, in, you know, the music scene. I think uh, Step Brothers, we can count that as one. <laughs> <laughs> there we can. <laughs> I know they're not the protagonists, but there's a lot of drummers in This is Final Tap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, did die. you did you identify their, with the plight of the drummer and this, like how they <laughs> explode? Or <laughs> um, Well, I never exploded on stage. but uh... Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway um then you and i saw this movie together for the first time uh in california at universal studios mm -hmm. uh, with a bunch of our friends um i had never heard of it uh i didn't i didn't have any expectations going into it um but i think we all really had a good time we came out you know feeling good it was a it was a feel-good movie it was yeah. I, I was kind of inspired by it anyway i don't know how, if you can say the same but i was and so, yeah, so I want to talk about this one and we can kind of chat about uh, my experiences in bands because I have been in bands, you know, my whole life. Anyway, I started playing at a very young age and uh, my brother, he bought this drum set and I just started fooling around on it. And I somehow intrinsically knew how the drums worked. I knew what drum did what. I knew how to keep just a, a, the beat. And I didn't know I could even do that until I started trying it. And then... 
I just kind of fell in love with it. And I would come home from school and I would practice for hours and hours and sometimes three to four hours a night. Mm -hmm. And my parents were really supportive. My mom would come down and listen to me play and she'd encourage me to keep going. And, you know, sometimes my dad would be like, yeah, it's too loud. Be quiet. <laughs> uh, you know, because drums are loud. Yeah, such um, a dad thing to say, right? I, I, so that was the reason why my brother bought the drum set was because he was trying to start a band. Mm -hmm. And him and his older, his, his friend, um, they were 16, 17. I was only 11. And even though I got real good real quick, they didn't want me in the band because I was too young. So they started holding auditions for other drummers. And these drummers would come in and they would just, they were terrible. They couldn't <laughs> the beat. They couldn't, they didn't know what they were doing. They, maybe they were just too shy or nervous or whatever. But they would try to play. And every time I'd be in the room watching them audition and I would just kind of step in. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. Let me show you how it's done. And I kind of, you know, push him out of the way and I'd play the song. And my brother and his friend were like, uh, I think he's the guy. You know, I think we got to let him play for us because he's, he's obviously better than the rest of these guys. So that's kind of how I started out. Um, and I've been in, playing in bands ever since. I, the past five or six years, I haven't because I've been moving around the country. Right. But, um, you know, my goal is to one day get back home and join up with my brother again and start another band and see where it takes us. But uh it's it's been a lot of fun um and like i said it's it's also fun for me not being in a band currently to watch these films about um drummers so anyway um as far as our experience like i said i was it was inspirational to me i i, I really loved this movie but real quick though tell me what your history with it was and and what your thoughts are well your uh history is basically my history it's just like you know we were all out visiting a mutual friend jason he's been on he was living in california at the time um, we were just hanging out in Universal Studios and us being movie guys, it was uh, us and the, like you said, our other friends and just like, hey, there's let's go see a movie because it's just right here. And I know that I'd seen the trailers for the Tom Hanks, this new Tom Hanks because, you know, talk, we'll talk about that. Maybe we'll make that our first topic. But Tom Hanks was like all over the place during the 90s, right? To the point where he could get his own writing directing gig for movie. And so I remember watching the trailer for the movie which we just listened to slash watch, but watching the trailer in the end, it goes written and directed by Tom Hanks. And you're like, oh, like first you think it's a Tom Hanks movie, but then you see he wrote and directed it. So you're like, I'm, I'm in, like, let's go watch this. And it was, it was a fun time. It's like, you know, you're talking about the movie being inconsequential. I know that especially like, or notoriously, I guess you could say, like the Siskel and Ebert review, which is strange because Siskel gave it a mixed review and he was mixed on it because he thought it was fun, but he thought there was no point to it. And so that was his negative. Like, I, I can't, I, I can barely recommend this. And then Eber was like, well, you know, what do you go to a movie for? You go for two hours to have fun. And this movie is fun. And even though he, did, he agreed that it was inconsequential, that was the main thing that they focused on. Like, it didn't have any point, right? But, and, and you know, that's how I watched it. It's like, it's a fun two hour, it's a bubblegum movie. It's like a, a Beatles song. It's like in one ear, out the other. It's great while you're listening to it, right? But then as soon as it's over, it's like, you're, you're on to the next thing. So I just remember walking out of the theater liking it but then i don't have the connection that you have you know we kind of do like us being in plays right yeah. i can definitely identify with that of you know, going out on stage and you know when we were in man of la mancha together which you talked about before just the being able to sing a solo and then finishing and just getting the you could feel the crowd getting all riled up and just breaking into applause and and yeah. then you go out the next time, you, you kind of get nervous that you want, you're getting ready to feel that again. So I, I can identify with that. So that's, it's definitely got some identifiable stuff. I just thought walking out of the movie that it's a bubblegum fun movie. And that's all it was really trying to do, which is Tom Hanks, right? And at the end of the day, if a movie can entertain you and make you forget the problems of the world for two hours or an hour and 45 minutes, then it's a success. Like, what's the problem? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, why are you picking it? And then over the years, obviously, I've, I've you know, if you dig a little bit deeper, you can find a little bit deeper meaning. But on, even as a surface level movie, I think it works. And so it, that's why we're still talking about it today. It's just fun. And it works. Yeah, I mean, it's escapism at its best, I think. And um, I really like um, how they were able to kind of like play on the whole Beatlemania thing and yeah. kind of like bring that because that was that was big. You know, the Beatles were huge. And then there was, there was other bands like the Rolling Stones and there was Dave Clark Five. I know Tom Hanks was a big Dave Clark Five band. And in fact, the song sounds very, you know, similar to the Dave Clark Five, you know, um, yeah. catalog. You got the Glad All Over. You got the... What are some other ones that they've done? I don't know. I can't think of right now. But um, but yeah, if you listen to Dave Clark Five and listen to that thing you do, I mean, they're very, very similar. Right, right. Um, 
Yeah. And so I, I, that's one of the things that I liked about the movie. It could have been like a Beatles ripoff or homage and not say anything, but they make no qualms about them kind of, uh, you know, focusing and making their whole personality. They model themselves after the Beatles. I know like uh, uh, Villa Piano says of like, hey, Ringo, get on stage. Or, you know, when um, uh, Faye is talking about, oh, like instead of like the Beatles, like B-E-A, we can say oh, the wonders like O-N-E. Or then later when the Troy Chesterfield character is talking about, oh, you know, this is what we need, like another like uh, a haircutting contest, something like that. So they make no qualms about it being very Beatles like They even mentioned yeah. the Ed Sullivan show. And so that's something yeah. that I like, that it's kind of the American version of that pop band kind of sound. And so, yeah, that's 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 very interesting and kind of kind of fun. It, it doesn't shy away from that stuff. I, I like that a lot. Right. Well, I wanted to kind of talk about uh, Tom Hanks and uh, why he did this movie. Yeah. Um, I know he had kind of, you know, for a couple of years or so, had this just idea float around his head. And then he finally decided to kind of try to put it to paper and see what he could come up with. And he, he, I think he said he started writing in December. And by March, he had like a rough draft. You know, it, it wasn't like super polished, but it was it was a good, you know, starting point. Like it's it starts here, it has the, you know, the formula that has a good ending so he knew he had something yeah. but it, like i say it wasn't it wasn't perfect yet and yeah. so the, i think he was writing perfect. it yeah he was writing it during force gump in philadelphia like when he was shooting force gump and when he was doing the oscar like run for philladelphia he's like i think i need something else in my brain like right i can't have all this oscar stuff so, so that's it was interesting too that he went to to this kind of genre because you know philadelphia and even forrest gump are they're kind of heavy movies you know what yeah. i mean they're they're so it takes a lot out of you so i can see why he would want to go this route and to write something a little more fun a little more you know upbeat and just kind of fresh and you know not so dark and heavy right well, that's that's interesting things, because if you're we like we said, we've already covered Forrest Gump, like we had Gareth Green on, obviously, to talk about that. And so it, like we talked about before, like we're going to have like Edward Norton going to keep popping up. Fincher's going to keep popping up. Tarantino is going to keep popping up. It's just the 90s. Some, it's something worked. It just worked over and over and over again. And Tom Hanks was like right there. Like if you look at his filmography, I mean, even starting from the 90s, he had like what Joe versus the volcano in 1990 uh, bonfire of the vanities, which we'll talk none at all about like that and then obviously league of their own 92 philadelphia 93 forrest gump 94 95 he had apollo 13 and he had toy story and so yeah. just being able to be in a position of tom hanks's stature that he can do you know what i think i'm going to write and direct my own movie next and that's what happened you know yeah. what i mean it's, it's, a, it's a nice trajectory but tom hanks was so beloved like we talked about i saw the trailer it was a tom hanks movie i'm in like let's go see the new tom hanks movie and once you reach that level where you can say like, you know, you just write a script and it gets made. I mean, yeah. that's, that's kind of what I always wanted to be was I just wanted to be like, there, I wrote a script. Let's make it. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> and um, I understand that process that he was going through. Cause yeah. I, I wrote a screenplay once where I actually thought about it for years, like probably three to four years. I just thought about this idea over yeah. and yeah. over again. I couldn't get it out of my head, but I couldn't think of how to, where to start. I couldn't think of where it was going to go. And then just one day it clicked. And it was like, once it clicked, I, I sat down and I wrote the first draft in two weeks. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So I, I can I can relate to that. <laughs> right. And then it was interesting too. Tom Hanks is, again, he's he's beloved. Like he, he he's, you watch him in interviews, like he just drops, like needle drops information. And you're like, oh, how do you know all this? Like you store all this. And he's very like, just very casual about it. He just has all this stuff stored in his head. So that's where you get a lot of references in the movie. But even so, when he wrote the script, like obviously if you're Tom Hanks, you could turn in a script and say written by Tom Hanks and somebody's going to green light it. And I think what he did is he went to Jonathan Demme, who directed him in Philadelphia and said, I, since you directed me in this movie, I want you to produce this for me. And Jonathan Demme arranged it that he, instead of just presenting the script as Tom Hanks wrote it, he, I think they put a pseudonym on it and gave it to the studio just to see if they could get it sold in the material alone. And they did. Like, it worked and it sold. And it's like, oh, and by the way, this is a Tom Hanks. Movie. Oh, okay. So they're, you know, they're already roped in. Same thing yeah. when they hired, like, Steve Zahn. Like, Steve Zahn didn't know it was a Tom Hanks script. He just auditioned for the part. And then, and Tom Hanks was there at the audition. And he found out that he wrote it. So it was just a bonus on top of this material that was already good. I yeah. just like that there's that humility to Hanks that that helps. You know, he's just an all-around good guy. <laughs> you hear a lot of the stuff about it. It's just, it's fun. Yeah. When you talk about uh, Steve Zahn, and, and I want to talk about the casting real quick, because yeah. it seems like they just found these people, like, and they just found the right person, you know, 
and they just kind of showed up. I mean, he was saying like too, when, when Liv Tyler walked in the room, he was like, oh, there she is, there's Faye. Like just by her walking in the room, he knew she was the one. Or, you know, Jonathan, it was like, yep, he's the guy. Or And he was so like prepared. He came in with like, a, you know, his hairdo all done the right way. He had like the white shirt and the skinny, you know, black tie. And yeah. he put so much effort into the audition. And he was like, yeah, that's obviously Jimmy, right, <laughs> you know? Right. Well, he was like, I wish all casting could be that easy because it, usually it never is. Right. But it just seemed to be really easy to get this cast together for this movie. Yeah. Ethan Embry, I think, too, just had this kind of weird, I want to kind of say like Crispin Glover type energy, like this kind of off kilter weirdness that made it. I can see that. Yeah. And it, it sells that part. It's, it's interesting. I think the joke is because nobody ever remembers who the bass player is, but it's interesting that Embry's cast is this character who's very, you know, army kind of focused all this stuff but we never question i know lenny's name i know jimmy's name i know guy's name heck i know Faye's name which you know even guy when he's talking to del paxton later he doesn't remember that the, the base he says Faye instead of the bass yeah. players yeah. but it, his, he's listed as tb player and we don't right, question right. it right. and i think it's interesting because isn't that the way that the role is written it's he's written as kind of being anonymous and so it doesn't really matter yeah so I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. But the thing that's cool about having Liv Tyler in there is it's great how you have somebody who's already got like a musical kind of background to kind of sell it, even though she doesn't sing. I know Liv Tyler's never been a singer, even though her, what was the story? Like her mom had an affair. She was married to Todd Rundgren, the musician. And then she had an affair with Steve Tyler at the time. Hmm. but didn't tell anybody and so Liv Tyler grew up thinking that Todd Rudgen was her dad and then I think around 10 or 11 that's when they finally oh by the way this this guy Stephen Tyler we couldn't tell anybody because he had like kind of a drug problem at the time we didn't want to and I had an affair with him so then she found out like in her teens like this is her dad but anyway I just think that's interesting and then you know Chris Isaac comes in obviously later too having again there he doesn't have a musical part but just having him there it kind of helps sell that yeah know, is that that musical identity for would you agree with that yeah. In fact, I always thought it was funny when Liv Tyler uh, was in the movie and it was like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, Steven Tyler's daughter. I right. thought, wouldn't it be funny if like all of a sudden all these actually started popping up <laughs> who were yeah. also Steven Tyler's kids? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just the one. Yeah, just the cornucopia of offspring. <laughs> um, but yeah, so also the band and the song we got to talk about the song because that thing you do the song is instrumental to this movie and um, it it's funny because even it has that Dave Clark five Beatles sound. It has that, you know, the poppy hook. And, um, but for me, I don't know about you, but I don't get tired of listening to it. Like yeah. I listen to it over and over again. And you do in the movie, you hear it maybe 10 or 11 times as you're watching the movie and you start to think, man, how many times have I been playing this song and I'm still not sick of it, you yeah. know, but that's yeah. kind of to the, the songwriter, Adam Schlesinger, is that his name? Right. Um, yeah. I think he, he wrote a great song. And, and also, by the way, Tom Hanks helped write a lot of these songs in the movie. Yeah, um, I, I want to come back to Schlesinger. But the thing that's really interesting about this movie is to save them time um, because of, uh, you know, you have to worry about rights issues and things like that. When you get songs of the period, you have to worry about like, right. having them redone. But instead of doing that, they bypassed all that. And every song, every ounce of music or every instance of music in this movie is original. They like Tom Hanks wrote it, Schlesinger wrote it, Rick Elias wrote some, and Scott Rogness and Mike uh, Picarillo, I think was his name, Gary Getzman, Howard Shore, obviously, who did the music for it. But you had all these people, so every down to the drum solos. So when Guy is playing the drums at the end in the in the studio, Tom yeah. Hanks came up with that drum solo, like he wrote it, I guess you could say, like, and so he performed it, right? Mm -hmm. So just every single, and I think for the what is it, I'm loving you lots and lots, that first song right out of the yeah, gate. That was that's, Tom Hanks. Yeah, that's written by Tom Hanks, right? So I, I like that it has this musical identity and they it sounds appropriate to the time. I think that's what's amazing. Like you could tell me that it, all this music was not was or not original and that it was written by actual popular people at the time. And I'd be like, yeah, like I buy it. Sounds appropriate. In fact, I walked away thinking Del Paxson was a real, you know, jazz drummer. Yeah. <laughs> would, you, would you say that that's a, a testament to Hanks as a writer and a director? Is that, is, is that we never question it because of that? Or is it just the mood that he creates? Yeah, I think so. Because I mean, that's the, that's the world he wanted to create. And I think, you know, I think uh, he did a good job doing so. Um, uh, even the other names of the other musicians in the bands, like Willie Walker, I think is one of them. I, yeah. I buy that. And Diane Dane and Freddie Fredrickson, all right, these right. Uh, the songs that they sing, they they sound like they are famous, you know, acts. And so 
Yeah. It's, it's, I think he did a good job in creating those. Yeah. And then going back to Schlesinger, I know he was the lead singer for Fountains of Wayne. And he, he I think he wrote uh, some of the songs for music and lyrics with Hugh Grant and Drew Barrymore. So he's got in Stacy's Mom. <laughs> it's a great song, obviously. But, you know, he his songs are so catchy that I think they earned um, a, a place in our hearts. Right. But then what did he he passed away at like 52 of like covid related um issues uh late last year or something like that but uh even to the point where i think the cast uh during the height of covid they got together um uh for a, a company called music cares and they did a watch party so it had uh, jonathan sheck was there uh tom everett scott was there steve zahn ethan Embry, uh giovanni rabisi pops in colin hanks who's in the, the movie for a brief uh, shot yeah, for like a brief second, yeah. he, he, <laughs> he's there and he's he's just like his dad he's very verbose and he's very funny and witty and then uh, kevin pollock even showed up for a part to joke around with him but they were able to raise something like uh what was it like fifty five thousand dollars or something like that because mm. of this uh this watch party that they did but schlesinger you know passing away like that the note that i have for the song and i think we even talked about it um when the movie came out is it's a good thing that this song is so catchy because if you're and you know this having to play the same songs over and over and over again for people that maybe haven't heard it but if you're going to hear what i think what is it they play the song 11 times and only twice in its in its uh entirety but even then, like, it's got to be a good song for you not to get tired of it. And I think you're right. Like, I could still listen to it now, like, 11 times. And it's still a fun, yeah. poppy song. Yeah. I mean, I definitely know what that's like. Uh, when you would, like, when they brought this band together for this movie, they actually had them rehearse for, like, two months or maybe more. But they made them learn their instruments. I don't know if they already knew. I think Tom knew how to play drums already, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, the other ones kind of had to learn the guitar. I don't think Jonathan Sheck knew how to play guitar. <laughs> they even had to hold one. So they were like, <laughs> here, here's how you hold it. Anyway, um, so they, they practiced for two months and they became a band. And so that's why it sells on screen because they were a band off screen. They, they rehearsed like a band and, and they, they got to know each other. They had that, you know, um, rapport that was built. And so you have to have that as a band and you don't always have that. That's why bands don't last very long usually because you've got four or five people you know, these different personalities trying to mix and trying to make this thing happen. And that's the hardest part about it because everyone has their own ideas. Everyone wants to be, you know, heard. And it's and to come together and to make one um, unified vision or song or whatever, or music, it's, it's hard to do. And and it's a testament to the, the movie and to the guys in the movie that they were able to, you know, become a band. Yeah. first before they started filming and that that translates to film i think okay so you do think them working together because I, I know that they didn't always play on stage they still had some people play for them um and i think even um who was it like i think it was mike viola of uh candy butchers he's the one that does the the, the uh, jimmy's voice um so he did the, the performing for that i i think steve zahn even performed Dance with me tonight. I think that's actually him. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. We talk about it, but you, you basically them working together, and and I guess that my the next thing I want to talk about because when I watched this movie, I, I, like I, I watched it twice since you said you wanted to do it. The first time I watched it, I was like, well, I'm going to watch it from Johnny's perspective because it's interesting. I know we've talked about your band history before, but we haven't really gone in depth into it. And I think that's this is a good opportunity to do that. So I've written down some questions for you that I wanted to ask you. And if you wanted to give us some like examples. Okay. Um, and again, what's cool about this is it's personal. Like this is not just bubblegum for you because you can see yourself in this movie. Yeah. It's not inconsequential. And that's a topic we're going to come back to again and again. But you kind of answered my first question. It's like, you, you, so you think they look like a band. You think it paid off their time together. Yes, I think that definitely paid off. I, I think that worked. Um, I think that was necessary too. I don't think it would have worked had they not done that. Yeah. And it's fun because I mentioned that little watch party. What is it like 20 five something years after the fact they still get along fairly well like you can tell that they liked each other in, in yeah kind of fun hanging out so my second question for you, we're kind of going to go in order of how the movie's organized but when they are first playing in front of that talent show do that do you think the movie nails the feeling of playing in front of a live audience does it nail that i think so i mean i've i've been in those you know situations before where you're trying to set up while well, the, the act is in front of you is still going and you're trying to be quiet and all that. I, I've I've done that. Um, in fact, that's the worst part of playing gigs for me yeah. is get 
drum is set up and taken down. I hate that part of it. <laughs> I've always just dreamed of having a roadie that would set my drums up for me and be ready to go. And I could just leave when I was done. But um, anyway, also, here's the other thing, too. I don't like anyone else helping me do it. <laughs> I wouldn't do it myself. But <laughs> people wanting to help you set up, like, just don't touch anything. Let me do it. Yeah. But anyway, um, yes, I definitely put myself in, in their shoes when they're trying to get things set up. And um, yeah, I mean, we actually had that happen to us. We played a, a talent competition once where we were obviously the best band in the competition. And even before the last band played, I think he came up and announced that we were the winners. And I was like, <laughs> so when he announces right away that, you know, they won. Wow. And <laughs> like, yeah, that, that happened to us too. Yeah, it's so, interesting. All the other bands that perform were like, well, why did we even show up? <laughs> <laughs> that's fun okay so my next question so obviously they, they meet with phil horace uh the band and they, they put their song and he, he said i'm gonna get your song on the radio within a week's time or whatever and so there's that scene of them all working and it shows Faye like putting uh or shows the tv player like putting on his army outfit or whatever and then it shows Faye like at the mailbox and she's listening on their the headphones and all of a sudden the song comes on the radio i know that drew mcweeney has a story that he tells but him and his writing partner when they wrote their first play and just being able to sit down after everything was done and it was performed and hearing everybody laugh at the right moments and, and sigh at the right moments and just react perfectly. Like that was a high for them. And so my next question for that is, does this nail the feeling of hearing that sequence in particular? Does it nail the feeling of hearing your work on an album for the first time or on the radio? On an album? I mean, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's always fun to hear your music played back to you because I mean you created it and so that, that's always really uh for me it's really uh fun to do but anyway I love that scene I love watching her you know try to mail a letter and then forget and then like just start screaming and run on the sidewalk and then they all kind of like join in and and the whole thing in the in the furniture store or the appliance store yeah where yeah. they're down and turn the radios on and the song gets louder and louder the energy in that scene and and the feel that you get it's so satisfying because that's like the dream that I always had that I would hear my son on the radio and that I would have this like you know shoot to stardom or whatever um, would like launch a career or whatever so to see that you know played out it's kind of like I can I can definitely put myself in their shoes and imagine that it's me having that experience and so it's always really fun for me to watch that scene Right, right. And then we can even apply it to podcasting too, right? I mean, um, I know um, the the podcast Verbal Diorama and her in M's episode on that thing you do, she talks about, we can apply this to podcasting. It's like you create something, just like you said, and you hear your voice and you, you put together the show and being able to share that with people, that's something special. So yeah, that can definitely yeah. tie in uh, for us here. Um, so when they are performing at the boss, because, and everything's going uh, terribly for them, right? Um is that an experience that you've had? Does that nail the feeling of having a bad performance? Yeah, I even had a, a performance on Friday the 13th. And while we were playing, like my 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 kick drum beater fell and I could no longer use my right foot. So I'd use my left foot. And then the snare drum head broke. And then I had this one cymbal that would always fall off the drum riser, always, because I could never get it to you know fit. And so I used to start like just bolting it down or taping it down whenever I could, but uh, it fell off. So I had like a broken snare drum head and like I was using my left foot on the kick and my cymbal fell over. <laughs> so it was on Friday the 13th. It was like, we'll never play a gig on Friday the 13th ever again. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I, I totally can relate to that too. When his cymbal falls over or when they're, you know, the feedback is, is too loud or, when, or the mics aren't working, that kind of thing. But, um, that's something that, you know, happens. Okay. So when Phil is asking after the performance and they're walking down the street, when Phil asks, is basically says to the guy, you're the drummer, you're the timekeeper. Is that true? Is the drummer? Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that all drummers are the leader of the band, but I mean, yes. I mean, I mean, I mean, not, maybe not, you know, consciously, but because a lot of the front men want to think that they're the leader of the band. <laughs> right. But the drummer is like, he's the one holding together. He's the one, you know, and I agree with that in the movie. They do a good job of making sure that we know that Guy is the, he's the one that, that uh, you know, Tom Hanks first is introduced to. He's the one that they they go to, you know, when they make all these decisions. It's always Guy. And mm -hmm. um, he's the nice one, too. He's the one that's like, you know, making sure Faye's okay. He's the one that's making sure Lenny has money to go to Vegas. He's, you know, but then Jimmy's the, you know, the artist songwriter. And there are those, you know, personalities out there, too. And I have experienced that myself as well. There's been people that I've been in bands with that uh, just have an ego that won't quit. Uh -huh. And they think that they're just everything. And 
And it, it always causes friction and, and problems. And it's always like, I wish that just wasn't a thing. <laughs> Why yeah. can't we just, you know, just get rid of the egos and just make music? You know, that's all I ever wanted to do was just make music. And even though I did, you know, uh, get to do that, I, I always had to have, you know, some conflict within the, the group. But anyway, yeah, what was I saying? <laughs> no, that makes sense. That, that all ties in. So that was actually my next question, knowing like a Jimmy personally. That's funny because there, there are people yeah. with ego that think that they're, even though oh, they're yeah. not. <laughs> and do you kick them out of the band or you just kind of deal with it? Well, they usually self-eject. <laughs> they'll, just, they'll just leave themselves. And right. then, you know, you have to get, you know, a, a new member and that's always fun. Okay. So uh, next question too. What is it like bringing a new band member? What, I mean, once you've had good rapport, right? If you've got like uh, Zahn and Sheck and Embry and Scott working together, and then all of a sudden, like Embry is no longer part of it, because obviously he goes off and he's with the, the other army guys and he goes to uh, uh, Disneyland or whatever. That's where, where his character ends up. But And then they bring uh, Wolfman Scott Pell in, right? So how would it be? And I think that even plays off of like their acting. But what is it like introducing a new band member and the personalities? What, what is that experience like? Yeah, it's awkward. Um, I, I think that is is real to life when they meet Wolfman for the first time and Wolfman has to basically audition and show them that he can handle their stuff. Right. But the one thing that I've always kind of like, I know they don't do it, you know, because it's a movie, but you have to now rehearse with the new guy. You have to kind of like work him in, even though he can play he might not be, he might not gel with the drummer just the way the last bass player did. You know what I mean? Yeah. You have yeah. To kind of like refine that again. So you got to kind of start over again. So whenever a new member comes in, you've always got to just kind of take time to work that member into the band. Um, not just, you know, with their personality, who they are, but, you know, with, with what they bring to the table as far as their musical ability and stuff too. Yeah. Cause obviously something's not going to jive if you're not all getting along. There's a difference between working with somebody for a decade and yeah. working with somebody for a day. Right. We did have a, a, a bass player quit and we hired a, a new one. We had, we had auditions for a bass player and okay. uh, there were two that we were thinking of. And then a third guy came in and he just knew all the songs already. And he, he walked in and knew everything. He didn't miss a note. And so we were like, well, there's no, there's no work to be done with this guy. We can just bring him on and we can just keep going. You know, we can yeah. just kind of go back to playing gigs. And so we hired him because <laughs> okay. he knew what songs already. So, <laughs> well, easy uh, peasy, it didn't right? Take long to work him in. Perfect. Okay. And then, uh, so my last question that I have is, actually, no, I have two more questions. Does the movie, when they're performing for the uh, the fair, right? And they're even though they perform before, when they're all getting ready, and I think it's is it the first instance of Mr. White going, you guys all look good and you looking good in red, look good in, yeah, in the red yeah. suits, right? Look good in gold, yeah. That excitement does that does it master that the excitement of before you go out and you're just feeling the crowd and like you're, you're are we going to wow them? Are we going to be? Does it nail that feeling? Oh man, the energy is always so high, and uh, I I always get a little bit nervous, but then as soon as I start to play, it all goes away, and I just kind of fall into it. Um, and you know what that's like when you're backstage before you go on stage to, to perform in a play, like there's always that little bit of, you know, nervousness and the, and the anticipation of like getting out on the stage. But then once you're out there, it's like you're at home again. You know what I mean? Like you, you can just go. And so, but anyway, yes, the energy is there and it's, it's super exciting and it's really fun. <laughs> like there's nothing like it. It's so much fun. Right. Okay. And then, so the last question I have is when guys talking with, uh, uh Del Paxton, right? And they're talking about bands and like what, like a one hit wonder kind of thing. When Del talks about the disillusionment, the infighting, whether sometimes a, a month is too long, just kind of get a little dark for a moment. Is, is that something that has, has played a part in your being a part of a band? Hmm, maybe. Um, I mean, I've always, they've always lasted longer than, you know, a month or two. Um, the first band I was in, I think we lasted with the lineup we had for about four years. Um, and I think everybody got older and like got married and stuff. <laughs> but the second band, it was it was like uh, I don't know, maybe five five or six years that we were together. Okay. Um, and it's same lineup. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, the, the I did have the experiences with the guys with the egos, and they didn't last as long, but yeah. they were still longer than a couple months. Okay. So all right, so that's all my list of questions. But was there anything else that you took as kind of personal or oh I recognize that? Anything else in the movie that you kind of uh recognized? Um so, I mean, yeah, the the rehearsing in the garage, I did that. Uh uh the talent shows, you know, the the playing in, in front of a, a a huge audience for the first time. Um, that was always fun. I I got to 
open, we mentioned this before, I got to open for Queensryche and we played for 3,000 people. That was probably the biggest crowd we ever played yeah. for. Cool. We, we would average between 200 or 300, you know, a show. So to play for 3,000 was like, wow, that's a lot of people out there. And so that was real exciting to do that. And, and you know, Queensryche was one of my favorite bands growing up. And so get, to get to share the stage with them was like a dream come true. And I, after the show was over, I went to my brother who was, you know, my guitar player. And I was like, is this the pinnacle or are we just starting out? <laughs> Turns out it was probably, that was probably the pinnacle. <laughs> I don't know. You're still young. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, that, that's what I'm talking about. It's like, it, it's not so inconsequential if you're able to like put yourself in the shoes of what's happening on screen. Right. Yeah. Um, so if we're talking about the movie itself that, that's the next thing i want to talk about let's really dive into what's what's inconsequential what's not inconsequential or what's bubblegum what's not bubblegum okay with the movie i think first of all i think the movie really sells the period we talked about the music being yeah. very period appropriate i think you see a woolworth in the background you see obviously the the uh period appropriate cars and the vehicles um some of the dialogue might i'm not sure if using the word ass over and over again is uh, correct for the time I'm not sure. There's even a part where, you know, when you Mr. they meet Mr. White for the first time and like it's it's an eight, obviously 80 yard line when Full Horse is like, you know, you can be guy, you can do great things if you don't just sit on your brain. I thought that was like an interesting like little saying. I was like, did they say that or but it was 80 yard. I was going to throw me off when I hear that. Yeah. Yeah. But what did the ADR over? Was it an even weirder line that they thought I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. Anyway, so besides all that, like it looks I never questioned that we're in the 60s. I think they really sell that. Um, the thing with this movie, Tom Hanks had made enough movies that he knew how to make a movie. I think even he, when he's talking about the screenplay, he didn't know how to write a screenplay. He just kind of took everything. Oh, this is what I, I've seen on the screenplays I've received before. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's how I wrote it. But again, going to Jonathan Demme, who has a cameo in this movie as, as the director of the Captain Geach and uh, the ship shack shooters uh, part when they're shooting that movie um so he's a cameo there but he's got tak fujimoto who did the who did the cinematography for last uh, for silence of the lambs of all things obviously he did uh, philadelphia i believe but mm -hmm. the movie looks good we talked about the part where they're boss because i like the silhouette kind of um look at the cinematography we just see the audience kind of dark and just in black silhouettes because they're they're making fun of the band right so that's the cinematography is good and the colors pop, especially when they're on stage on the, the Plato and Galaxy of Stars. Did you yeah. agree with all that? Yeah, I agree with all of that. I think, um, I mean, first of all, doing a period piece is, is hard to do. Um, and But I think they did a really good job of, uh, of selling that. And uh, not just with the cars and, and the clothes and stuff, but with the, the choices of colors, like you were mentioning. I, I think it's, it's um, Again, a testament to Tom Hanks and his vision that he had for the movie. I think it really came to fruition. Um, probably, it probably exceeded expectations. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, we mentioned Howard Shore doing the music. I think Richard Chu was the editor who worked on like uh, the conversation and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and uh, the the New World. I think for Terrence Malick. So, an editor that's he knows how to do things right and so just surrounding yourself with these professionals i think it makes your job a lot easier i never not buy that it's set during the 60s i absolutely believe that it's very appropriate for the time there right. um but so those are all things we like i like the little details that they wove into the script like the first time you see them practicing the guy gives Faye a little glance like if you're talking about film language it shows Guy playing the drums and he's looking at something and it cuts to Faye playing the darts, right? And so he obviously has something for her, even though it's never mentioned out loud. And then later, I like when Charlie, Liv Tyler is, is talking to Charlize Theron and like they talk and like, well, how long is this going to be? And Faye says, I don't know, I've never been to one of these before. It's nice to meet and she gets up and like Tina gives her a look, like she watches yeah. after her. And I'm like, what is that? Like, did she know that there's something going on between... Does she recognize it and, and the guy doesn't? He suspects it, right? Right. And even the part where, um, you know, they're, they're in Wisconsin and they're running to the cars and they leave, leave uh, Faye behind and it's Guy that has to go back for it. It's not, it's not Jimmy that goes back for his girlfriend. And that even right. ties into the Beatles. I think they were performing somewhere and the Beatles ran to a car and uh, I think John Lennon's wife was left behind. But it, and not the movie, unlike the movie, like she didn't get on the train like they she didn't ever make it onto the and they didn't get her but so even that ties in but i like that little touch i like that when they're on the plane and phase sick and 
guys paying attention to her and he goes and right. tells jimmy like Faye's not feeling too good and jimmy doesn't care like he it doesn't matter to him right, right? and so even though you see Faye like gawking at jimmy during performances jimmy looks at her once but i think it's like performative like that's what you get from him at the end right yeah and it's yeah. all about his it's all about him and so i don't know i just liked all those interesting things to the point where the romance feels earned right, right? but speaking of the whole jimmy and, and Faye uh relationship i think all of that leads up to that moment in the dressing room after they play the, the the TV show and she kind of lets him have it. I think that is probably one of the best deliveries. And in fact, I would say she is probably the best, you know, actor in the movie. She's the one who she sells it more than anybody else does. I think, I think she's the best in the movie. I, I, I mean, I feel like Tom Everett Scott, he not was just doing an impression of Tom Hanks. I know they said that he looked like him and they were kind of worried about that as far as casting him and everything. Um, but it's almost it's pretty obvious that he was basically imitating Tom Hanks. Um, he does a good job of not being, you know, going overboard with it. Yeah. But I mean, obviously, you can see Tom Hanks in that role and Tom Hanks saw himself in that role. And but he did a good job doing that. But however, as far as like a, a real performance, I think Liv Tyler is the one who nails that. And that scene where she's when she tells Jimmy off, man, it always gets to me. It's always like, wow, that was really good. Like that was just I mean, it's rare when you get a performance like that. Yeah. Well, the thing that's interesting about that scene too is it the argument could be made that Jimmy is well within his rights to be act like he does, you know, because he he knows he's being played. It's all about the art for him, but mm -hmm. he's he ends up being played like the whole time. And so, but that's the so you could side with him kind of there, but the the cart you can't side with is how he treats Faye. Like he he treats her like an object right yeah. and so her coming back with that i mean all he has is like i should have dumped you in pittsburgh that's all he's got right because right? that's it's not a, the relationship is not important to him yeah so again we can look at this movie from that bubblegum perspective and yeah it's it's period appropriate and it, it's you know it, it works as a, a movie and it's very solid filmmaking wise but and that's it we could leave the movie like that it's a fun like kind of beatles-esque um yeah, elvis it, it, another level right <laughs> yeah there's another level so you can play like that so here's the level that i picked up on i told you that i watched it twice and the part when i watched it the second time the part that really stuck out to me is when um chad <laughs> giovanni rubisi when he breaks his arm right, right. and uh jimmy and uh lenny have to go into the patterson's the shop to go and ask guy if he can play the drums for them so it's always stuck out to me uh, when they go in there. I want to get this right. I originally thought it was uh, Thunderbirds, but it's not. It's uh, It was the predecessor, the precursor of that show. It's called Fireball XL5, which debuted in 1962. Okay. So they're watching this on the screen in black and white. And number one, I think it just, saw, at first it just seemed like, oh, they're just telling us that this is the 60s. Like this was TV. This is what you saw, right? But they comment on it. Like Lenny goes like, it took us a while but those are puppets right they're those those are strings and jimmy's like they're called marionettes that's what they're called and then that's when they talk to guy but i think it's interesting because when you think about it it's not just in there for the sake of being in there because what are the wonders what happens to the wonders for the rest of the movie oh uh, they become puppets <laughs> yeah basically they get taken over by playtime right they become puppets and that's what i'm talking about with jimmy is obviously he's fighting back but it's even to the point where like yeah guy agrees to be a part of the band but at the cost of you have to buy two new record deals right so he's in a way he's manipulating them to get him to play to get what he wants to the point where we're talking about the drummer being the timekeeper when they're on the and they're ready to go and it's a ballad right like jimmy's written it as a love song but instead, I think without telling anybody, Guy just takes the initiative and starts playing it as a fast rock song. And obviously, Jimmy is rightfully upset because you're messing up the song without telling anybody, mm -hmm. right? But again, you're being puppeteered. They're, they're basically marionettes. Like, they're being dragged along because Guy, like you mentioned before, is making all the decisions for them. Nothing would happen. It's like Faye at the end saying, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for you. And I mean that in a good way. Right. They have to, except for Lenny saying, a guy in a really nice camper wants to sign a player song on the radio. Other than that, it's it's guy that's kind of making all the decisions when they go and talk to Mr. White. I think it's interesting because you can look at it too. There's, there's shades to everything. Like Mr. White, first of all, they name him Bland. He's a blandly named character. He could be anybody. Same with Guy. He could be anybody. I think that's why we plant ourselves onto him. We imprint because Guy's just a, we're guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? That could be us. 
And so when they become part of the Playtone label, they're being puppeteered. But then there are scenes when, like, you know, Mr. White is talking to Faye and he's like, well, what about, um, you know, I know you're with Jimmy, but what about Guy? Like, how's he doing? Like, what kind? And so he's playing matchmaker between them. Yeah. To the point where he's nice. So I think a critic um, locally for the Salt Lake Tribune, Sean P. Means, I think he nitpicked when the movie came out. Like, he didn't like that Tom Hanks was like a fairy godmother type character. And you can read it that way because they're giving you these little crumbs that that's what he is. He's like the matchmaker. He's like the godfather that puts everything together. And he's he's the, the magic man that makes this all happen. But he's also a record producer. He recognizes that he can make money off of the wonders. And he takes all his attention off of Diane Day and all his attention off of Freddie Fredrickson because the wonders are climbing the charts. These are the guys I'm going to focus on. And mm-hmm. so they go to you know they're they're on the radio or whatever and the which is interesting because it's paul feig um playing that character what was the um uh i'm trying to find the kmpc disc jockey you know how they're there and it's like whoa like visitor from the yeah yeah visitors from the east like or whatever like oh no not those mop top and then it's just welcome the wonders and all they do is they say hi and that's it like thanks guys leave the thing in uh, yeah. But we had to mention Paul Feig because we're coming full circle in a way because uh, his Ghostbusters 2016 is what kind of inspired Nostalgia Cast along with Gareth, uh, yeah. who again appeared before. But I just thought it was it was kind of a fun tie in there. But when they go see Saul Silo, like, he doesn't care. Even Guy says, "I don't think Saul Silo is the guy that listens to records. Like he just comes down, he schmoo- he schmoozes, he eats his sandwich, and then he's gone." Like. Mm-hmm. Jimmy is rightfully upset because where does the art go to, you know, to the point where Lenny's like, well, there he goes as lone as in, in his principles, you know, that kind of thing. It's like Jimmy's the only guy that seems to recognize they're being manipulated. It's not about the art. It's about the commerce. Right. Yeah. So we can look at all this and it's interesting because all this is there. All the stuff that we just talked about or that, I, that I was mentioning here, it's there in the script if you're looking for it. But it's yeah. also, would you agree that it's also there, but it's easily ignorable? Oh, sure. Yeah. And if you don't know it's there, you're not going to notice it. Yeah. But that's what we're talking about. It's like, it's not so inconsequential if, number one, you can apply yourself to it, like being a band member, right? It's not inconsequential if you have these themes of being manipulated, right? And then, again, to the point where Jimmy exits himself, like he's done. Like, I, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. Um but then he's still part of the yeah yeah but he's still part of the the puppetry because he comes back we find at the end he comes back and he becomes a movie a a record producer right which is interesting but the other maybe we want to talk about that extended cut because i know um i tried to mention it to you but you weren't able to find a copy of it the extended cut the the youtube scene i saw them on youtube so they're available but the the movie is like an extra 40 minutes there's 40 minutes of additional material and you're like yeah. Wow, for a movie that's trying to be an Elvis or Beatles type biopic, like a fun 50s, 60s throwback, like why would it be two and a half hours? You know what I mean? Like that's, it doesn't quite suit the tone that you're going for. But this, the second layer that it's still there in the movie, but the, the deleted scenes, the extended scenes, it really points it out. I know there's, um, number one, there's a uh, subplot with uh, Mr. White, turns out that he's gay. And he's got like um, uh, Howie Long, I think, shows Howie up and it's his boyfriend, right? And again, for I'm not sure if that was appropriate for the time. I'm not sure if they had like little uh, the the homosexual subplots tied into like 50s and 60s movies. So that doesn't really tie in. Even though I don't have a problem with it being in there, I just think it's it's weird that it's like an extra layer that doesn't need to be. But it 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 ties in with like I think the Beatles manager Brian Epstein, he was gay, and so that's. It's kind of tying it in there. But, and then you have another subplot where TV player is, um, uh, he's having an affair with one of the Chantrelines, who's a, who's a black singer. And during that time, the civil rights movement, I don't know if that, they kind of make a big deal out of it in the extended cut. Like he shouldn't really be dating this, this woman because again, the, t- the time that it's there. But if we're talking about the interracial relationships, if we're talking about um, Mr. White and being in a homosexual relationship, there's even a scene where uh, Mr. Patterson, uh, who, what's that? Holmes Osborne is a really funny, funny actor. But 
there's a part where he's in the Patterson's and he's looking at a newspaper and he's like, oh, look at, and he's reading all this stuff and he goes, oh, like, oh, they're selling, they're selling a shoe polish kit or, oh no, they're open on Sunday. I don't think I want to work in a country where they're open on Sunday, right? And that, that does tie in with them kind of having uh, standards, the Patterson's having standards, but it also ties in with an anti-establishment theme that we mentioned before which the Beatles were anti-establishment, right? Guy kind of not playing a ballad and playing, uh, doing that thing you do as a fast rock number. That's anti-establishment because they established themselves as Beatles wannabes, right? So the interracial relationship ties into that anti-establishment theme. They're fighting against something. The homosexual relationship with, uh, with uh, the Howie Long character, I forget his name. Lloyd. Lloyd. Okay. So that ties in with the anti-establishment thing. So again, there's another layer there. It's interesting. And like we talked about when they cut it out for the extended version, it kind of eliminates that a little bit. It's not as, as pointed, but it's still kind of there. I, I don't know. I just think, is that another thing that, that you recognize in the movie, but isn't quite as played up in the theatrical version? Well, first of all, I usually I get upset when I see deleted scenes uh, in movies that I think should be in the movie still. And I have a hard time understanding why they cut those scenes. But with this one, it was like, yeah, I can see why they cut these scenes. Um, it does bog it down. They don't need that um, little extra bit that they throw in there. And I think just having the hints of it, like the hints of the relationships, that's fine. And I think that plays fine. And I think it, it serves the movie better to have those scenes cut from the movie. Right. And it, I mean, I'd still say that the theatrical cut is the perfect version of the story. Cause if you're, like we said, if, if you're trying to ape the feel of a sixties biopic, like the fun, like hard days night kind of, kind of feel it's, it's a light frothy entertainment. It's not like a deep dive into the culture of the time. I think I think that's the mood and that's the jibe that I got with it from the very beginning. It's a nice throwback to those times to the point where it ends with a where are they now kind of thing, like a biopic would, you know what I mean? So I think the theatrical thing works. I think the extended stuff is interesting. I just think that it's it's adding a layer that doesn't need to be there for the tone that they're trying to go for for the movie. Yeah, I agree with that. But it's like you said, it's all there. This is a movie that's not just bubblegum. It, it can be, and that's the sign of a great movie. It doesn't, it's not so heavy handed that it takes over the movie. I think that there's, you could watch the movie and there's no tie in. There's no deeper meaning. It's just, it's just what it is. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So I, I think that works. I mean, what, what do you think? Do you, do you think, do you prefer that the, the theatrical version as it is, or do you agree that a movie should have layers? Do you think that there's layers to the, I don't know. I definitely think there's layers. I agree with you that um, I think that the theatrical version is the best version of the movie. Um, but I also like movies where it doesn't tell you everything and you have to kind of search for things and you have to kind of find these little, you know, uh, hidden gems in the movies. And I, I think that's great. I, I like that. Um, but then there are times too where I like it when they slap me in the face and say, here's what it is. You know what I mean? So yeah. it kind of depends on the movie. But I think this movie is... Um, best served without the the extra stuff you don't need all of that for this story right and again that's that's where i absolutely disagree with the siskel and ebert review i i don't think that it's that's totally inconsequential i think that you can find all these deeper meanings if you're looking for it. i just think when you're on a time crunch like siskel and ebert when you've got like 15 movies you need to write about in a single week you don't have time to really look at all the deeper kind of things so at least they were able to come across and give it two thumbs up um, whether that's worth anything but you know at least they're able to see that it is a fun movie and that's if that's all you're looking for in the movie this movie works like gangbusters i think that's why we're still talking about it today it's it's fun but never it's never slapsticky i know the humor i know that hank's like steve's on like on the fly when he's playing cards with those older guys like you want to see my deck you got to be quick you got to be quick with me. like they just made that up on the fly but it works it's just a nice it's never over the top humor it's just kind of fun um, you know, it, it's just fun humor. It's bubblegum humor. I, think. I will say, I think Steve Zahn as Lenny is probably the you know the comic relief, and I think he's he's the most fun for me to watch. Even though I'm a drummer and I relate with Guy, I yeah. love watching Lenny. I love I love his lines. I love his um, just his scenes are are so fun to watch. And I think that's what got me. Um, that's what introduced me to Steve Zahn was this movie. Like I didn't know really who he was until this, and then I started yeah. seeing other things and started really appreciate him as an actor. Um, but he's like I said, he's the comic relief. He's 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 the funny man in the movie, and he's he makes it for me. 
Yeah. Well, he kind of steals it, right? I mean, Tom Everett Scott is the protagonist and he's earnest and he's likable enough that he carries it. There's, I like having him as a lead. You have Jonathan Sheck, who's like the prick, you know, and he sells that even though we can argue that he's, he's right. And he's right to be upset in a lot of his scenes. He's being manipulated. He knows that. And then you have Lenny, who's the comic relief. I like that Lenny and Jimmy have a relationship that only Lenny never lets Jimmy go. Like whenever Jimmy has BS, Lenny always calls him on it when everybody else just kind of sits there. And then the Ethan Embry character, like we talked about, he's kind of in the background to the point where we don't even question that he has a name. He doesn't have a name. We don't care. It doesn't matter. (laughs) You know what I mean? So I think they all, they all sell their parts. I just think it's, it's, it's fun. I don't, I don't have any complaints about this movie at all. Yeah. I think Tom Hayes did a great job in his, in his first foray into directing. I'm not sure if he's done anything since, has he? I think he's a band of brother. Larry Crown. He, he, oh, Larry Crown, that's right. Yeah, yeah. the Near Vardalis, I think it has. Um, and then he launched the Playtone um, um, right. film company right. with Mamma Mia and My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Yeah, so, yeah. but as far as uh, directing goes, I think he did a good job. I think it's respectable. I think um, he got a lot of good performances out of the actors. You know, he created this world and these songs and the music. And I think it all came together. And like I said before, it was the right time. And he was going through some kind of heavy material previously and this was just what he needed to kind of like bring him out of that and i think it shows by what you see on screen and sometimes you need that in a movie sometimes when you watch a bunch of heavy stuff you just want something that's bubblegum fun like what yeah. it's a breather it's a palate cleanser why not like and why are we picking on it <laughs> because it doesn't reach for deeper themes even though i think the deeper themes are there so yeah all right well i think uh, we both agree it's worth remembering yes yeah, so absolutely. Um, Let's come back for the outro and let's do our favorite, um, I want to say drummer protagonist movies, <laughs> but I don't know if you have a favorite one of those. Okay. Uh, so let's do like uh, our favorite uh, fake biopic. Well, how about that? Like, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds fun. Let's do that. Okay. We'll be right back real soon. <laughs> And all the folks at the fair are showing you a time like you never had. Oh, I'm not here with these fellas. I got a big in competition over at the Livestock Pavilion, and I am going to win that blue ribbon. Okay, we're back. Uh, Darren, was there anything we forgot? Well, we it, it's such a fun movie. We could probably talk about all the little fun little details and little tidbits for the you know for hours and be able to, to laugh at those and giggle at it. But I just thought... You know, we mentioned Chris Isaac. We mentioned Kevin Pollack. Well, Charlie Theron, I guess, has what about Demi mentioned him. Jonathan Demi is in there. But I, I liked just kind of a little anecdote. There was a time that I went to a party, and this movie came out on the on uh, VHS or DVD or whatever. There was a party that I went to, and we watched this as as like a watch party kind of thing. And I just kept talking about all the trivia bits. Oh, there's Jonathan Demi. Oh, Chris Isaac is another. And to the point at the end when it has Peter Scolari come in, like his bosom buddy's partner, as uh, oh. uh, you know, has has him like, uh, gosh, I forget the name, Troy Chesterfield, right? And to the point, oh, there's this guy from Bosom Buddies, and I remember everybody at the party is like, shut up, like they didn't care about this. They told me just to stop, <laughs> just stop with the trivia, and I was like, oh, okay, you don't care about this. But, but yeah, so there's Peter Scolari in there. I like that um, Brian Cranston shows up in oh, a yeah, small part that's right, that's right. Uh, mark mcclure who was uh in uh, apollo 13 just the year before um okay. also the we talked about uh chris ellis as phil horace like he was in apollo 13 right he was in there um we mentioned uh, paul fee clint howard shows up howard, that that's right. yeah, he's uh, it was fun him. seeing getty watanabe show up for just a brief little bit um rita wilson we forgot to talk about her yeah. Yeah. Um, the anecdote I have, uh, even talking about that little watch party that they did, Tom Everett Scott says, um, I think they just had their first baby or something like that. And so Tom Hanks puts Rita Wilson in this cocktail dress and Tom Everett Scott goes, and I think that was the first time on set where Tom Hanks was so like attentive to me. I think that was the first point where he wasn't attentive to me at all. Because <laughs> obviously, and I think Rita Wilson did an interview where she said, "Oh, Tom really liked me in that cocktail dress." So that's that's kind of a fun little detail. Uh-huh. So it's it's nice having all these little recognizable little fun Easter eggs in there. And again, Rita Wilson's a good actress in her own right. She had that scene in Sleepless in Seattle that kind of stole the movie, talking about an affair to remember. So it's not mm-hmm. just in there for being just a quick kind of throwaway thing. All these people are just quality. That goes from all the people that work behind the scenes to all the people that were actors in the movie. It's just an all around good solid fun movie yeah 
Okay, well, we decided to do our favorite, uh, you know, fake biopic. Um, there's a few of those out there. Um, so what did you but, come But up? band-centric, right? Band, yeah, more band-centric. Yeah, that's right, it has to be more, yeah, exactly, yeah, band-centric. Well, <laughs> we mentioned This is Spinal Tap. We could do a whole episode of This is Spinal Tap. But as and this we probably is, will in the future. <laughs> right, but as this is Nostalgia Cast 90s Palooza, we want to kind of stick to, uh, um, to well, this isn't even a 90s movie. I guess we didn't even do that, but we, we did talk about This is Spinal Tap enough. I wanted to talk about Almost Famous, which is a 2000 movie, but still it ties in with our... Uh, our theme of, of kind of fake biopics. This is obviously the, the, the Cameron Crowe movie that's kind of mm -hmm. based on his um, growing up when he was a, a journalist for Rolling Stone at a run, uh, young age. Um, it talks about the band Stillwater. I know that uh, Billy Crudup is in there as the guitarist. Mm -hmm. It has Jason Lee as the lead singer. Um, Kate Hudson is a uh, not so much a groupie as a band-aid <laughs> is what she calls it. Okay. But the movie, I think this is the movie that Cameron Crowe made after or soon after Jerry Maguire, which is kind of the high mark for me is in his filmography but there's something so sweet and something so again it's it's autobiographical so there's it's an honest and a truthful movie that has a lot of truths about being a teenager and growing up with you know he has francis mcdormand uh the uh, what was this the, the lead actor in the movie patrick fugit who's very likable like tom effort scott he's a very likable actor he's very like charismatic and he can carry a movie and he's you know endearing and so he has Francis McDormand plays his mom. I think Zoe Deschanel plays his older sister. And it's just about him coming of age. It's a coming of age story. And all the truthfulness, especially of the Kate Hudson character and the way that the Crudup character realizes that he's front and center of the band and he should be and becomes more human. It's just a very human movie. And uh, if you haven't seen it yet, it's a very likable. It's R rated, obviously, but it's one of those movies where it's like, yeah, but the R rating kind of limits it. You know, you, you should be able to have teenagers see this movie and recognize themselves in it, even though it talks about adult themes. Uh, is Almost Famous, is that a, a movie that you enjoy? I do like that movie, yeah. Okay, okay. So, yeah, again, Cameron Crowe, I think that was probably his last, that was his last great one, and it's kind of been downhill. He hasn't quite uh, gotten back to the heights of Say Anything or Jerry Maguire, I don't think. But, again, yeah. Almost Famous, very autobiographical, very sweet. Yeah, that's a good pick. Well, I was... Uh torn between picking this is spinal tap or uh, a mighty win and uh, <laughs> i went with a mighty win i have to say because i i um became a fan of christopher guest um obviously with the princess bride and then when i saw waiting for guffman and he just kept turning these movies out these these mockumentaries kept popping out a mighty win um for your consideration uh there's some other ones um i can't think of them right now best in show best in show. show yeah best in show um they're just super funny and it's always the same cast just playing different characters um but a mighty wind has the band element um and they're they're playing folk music <laughs> and so it's yeah. it's just super funny to watch these these uh these guys play these characters and to sing these folk songs and act like it's just this really big deal and just everything goes wrong it's really funny and the music's actually pretty good and, and you can see christopher guest actually is an accomplished musician so it's fun to watch them play not just this a spinal tap but this this uh this trio um uh, in uh, a mighty wind as well it's really fun to kind of you know I don't know. I like this movie a lot. So there you right. Go. Well, it's got the stall. It's got Catherine O'Hara. It's got Eugene Levy. It's got Fred Willard. It's got Parker Posey. Yeah. It's Michael McKeon. Christopher Guest, like you said, Jane Lynch is in. There. It's always the same cast. It's just yeah. different. Just the same kind of a troupe, right? Um, uh, John Michael Higgins on him. He's always funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I don't know. Like those movies, like Best in Show, or this. Is, they 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 don't quite reach the heights of this is Spinal Tap. I'm not sure what it is. Whether it's the Rob Reiner influence, and then Christopher Guest kind of caught that bug and was able to do these kind of mockumentaries. It's the folk music. It's funny. These people are kind of like, oh shucks, you know, they got this kind of attitude about them. And so that that works. I just think that it's amusing. I think you get interchanged like Best in Show and, and you yeah, kind of yeah. get the same level of amusement out of it. But yeah, definitely. Definitely a fun. Uh, <laughs> I like that you mentioned that. That's also what was it like two thousand three or something like that. Oh, it wasn't a nineties movie. <laughs> no, so we we went ahead and we picked like two thousand, which is fine. I think before yeah. we've also done uh, other movies that weren't completely tied to the nineties. So, all right, that sounds good. So, Darren, what's next on the lineup? Okay, well, it's another. Wow, it's it's another guest that I can't believe uh, we're going to have on. She's. Um, kind of the the a, a joyful like if, if you're looking to look at twitter 
she's a she's part of the joyful sector she's got this great laugh and she's got this great attitude she is the co-host of the screen run podcast where they've done their first season was on i think kevin smith movies and then their second season they covered was uh, alien the alien franchise the spin-offs there they're about to start up their third season uh, i don't think they've announced uh as of us recording this i don't think they've announced the the topic and i don't want to spoil that for them but yeah so they're in their third season she's the lady Wan. Um, we've mentioned it before. I've met her through binge movies with Jason, who we had on for Jurassic Park. But right. like I talked about, she's very smart and she's very savvy and she's just joyful and she's never critical to the point where like you feel like you're being berated. And so the movie that she chose that we've been talking about, she chose Men in Black, which ah. we're gonna have to talk about Men in Black. Will Smith was big in the '90s, and it's I want to hit that because it's its 25th anniversary this year. And so that's okay. the movie that she wants to chat about. I am so looking forward to chatting with her again. It's just going to be like me just sitting here, just kind of in awe <laughs> of just the fact that she's on and be able to grace us with her presence. But she's so far, the guests that we've had have just been, you know, with, with Tim and with Lindsay and with Gareth, it's, it's, we're continuing that streak of just these great. Yeah. Guests. We've, we've had some good ones this season, so let's keep it going. Yeah, absolutely. So men in black with the lady one next time. Yeah. That sounds like fun. Okay. For nostalgia cast, I'm Johnny Craddock. And I'm Darren Lundberg. And we'll see you next time on Nostalgic Chat. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, we'll see you.